Metropolis. Good morning, everybody. Oh, look, I just want to say thank you to my South Pacific Division family. They're only small, but they act like little savages. Thank you, people. Love you. All right. Good morning, Pretoria. Swabona. Huamure. Or as my people from Tanzania would say, Habari Zena. Zene, okay. I'm from Fiji, and you know, our people sort of say, back in the day, we actually came from a place called Tanganyika. And I believe that's in Tanzania, yes? So hello for, for, to you guys as well. But I bring you greetings from the South Pacific Division. Nisa Mbula Binaka. This morning, as we share together, my prayer is that you will hear, that you will feel, that you will sense ever so clearly our faithful God whispering to you and to us, return to me, beloved. So I want to just acknowledge as my PowerPoint starts to come up on the screen there. Um, thank you. I just want to acknowledge our translators. I believe uh, for the Spanish, there is Dr. Ephraim Valesquez. Is that right? Those who are from, um, who are having the Spanish translations going through, Dr. Ephraim Valesquez, I want to say thank you to you. For Portuguese, Almir Maroni. For the French translator is Sister Louise No Candy. For the Russian translator is Anna. The Korean translator, Min Jun or Eddie. And of course, the Swahili um, translator, Tumaini. You know, we're a vast group here. And I want to just say thank you to those men and women who are sitting in the back room in a little box, watching everything happen and trying to talk so that everyone understands. And so often things are happening behind the scenes that we know nothing about. And so I want to pray that you will just bear with us as we go through um, this journey together. And of course, I want to thank Kurt, who's been organizing everyone with the translations. Return to me, my beloved. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so in John 13, 34 to 35, we read. This way? Awesome. Thanks, Pablo. John 13, 34 to 35, we read, a new commandment I give to you, that you do what? Love one another as I have, that you also, turn to the person next to you when you're saying it, don't say it to me, okay? Let's start again. A new commandment I give to you, that you, one another as I have, that you also, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have, one for another. Excellent. I find it interesting that all of our messages, well, I'm hearing a repetition of this message all the way through. From yesterday, last night, you know, it's about love, isn't it? Turn to the person next to you and say, it's about love, baby. <laughs> all right. That's what it's about. All right. All right. Relax. Relax. Okay. We're just talking here. All right. Here we go. This passage of scripture, I find it absolutely amazing. You know why? Because if you open your Bibles to this, what you'll notice is Jesus, it's, I think it's a Thursday night. Jesus and his disciples are sitting together. They're having this last meal. And in the midst of all of this, Jesus is saying to them, a new commandment I give to you. Jesus is aware because he knows everything from the beginning to the end. Jesus is aware that a man he has eaten with, a man he has worked with, a man he has lived with, is really in the process of actually selling him, denying him. He's actually backstabbing him at this very time. And Jesus still takes the time to encourage. He still takes the time to advise. He still takes the time to teach his remaining disciples this one truth. What's the one truth, people? Love. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's about love, baby. 
That's right. So you know, when you're standing in those lines for dinner and it's long, turn to the person next to you and say, it's about love, baby. That's right. When those buses are long and, and, and everyone is rushing around trying to get on those buses after the meeting at night, what are we going to say to each other? That's right. So don't be giving those people a hard time. Because what is it? It's about love, baby. That's it. That's what it's about. All right? Jesus is about to be killed here. He's having his last meal. And what he says to his disciples is this. Love one another. And you know why? Because when we love one another, when we're standing in those long lines and there's no food, when we love one another, everybody will know these people are followers of Jesus. Turn to the person behind you and say, are you a follower of Jesus? That's right, because it's about love, okay? This is what it's about, people. You know, our general conference youth director, Pastor Gilbert Kanji, in his wisdom, thought that it would be wonderful for some of us to come and be the hands and feet of Jesus before this awesome event. And you know, I want to acknowledge those of you who have come a week early, who have come a week early to be here to serve the people of South Africa. Give yourselves a hand. Yeah. And then there are some of you who are going to stay behind once this is over and you're going to be serving the people of South Africa. Give yourselves a hand. But you know what? I remember the day we got off the plane. I came with the director from South Pacific Division, Dr. Nick Cross. We got off the plane with a group of 14 young people. That's them, okay? Can we give them a hand? <laughs> yeah. A week ago, we got here. We got here to experience this moment in time. Right here, right now, all of us in this room, it doesn't matter about all the issues that we've been facing. This is a dream come true for us, yes? That's right. Is this a dream come true for us? So why is it that we complain when we have saved and we have prayed? We are in South Africa. Yes. I have w never dreamed in my life that I would be in this place. And I want to show you a picture. Actually, I put it up on my Facebook page when I arrived, yeah? But let me first go to this text here. Oh, let's go to this one here first. Okay. My beloved friends. Let us continue. Let me go through. Okay, my notes. All right. Let's go to this one here. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who is born of God and the person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. So when we're standing in the line, what is it about? Okay. When we're waiting for the buses, what is it about? Okay. When we're trying to get our breakfast and the line is long, what is it about? Right. It's about love. Okay. Yeah. We laugh at ourselves, don't we? Yeah, I know. I've been there too. All right. So next slide. I want to play a game with you. Is that okay? Can we play a game? Okay, excellent. Can I just go to the next slide? Okay, how many of you have seen this uh, image before? I see it on the screen down here, but not, yeah, that one. How many of you have seen this before? Put your hand up if you've seen it. Okay, the singing bee. How many do not know what the singing bee is? Say amen. amen. Okay, so the majority. Okay, wonderful. All right. The singing bee is a TV show that aired in America a couple of years ago. And basically, the, 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 the name of the game is you start with the line and then you have to finish it. Does that make sense? So, so we're going to try and play that. We're, we're going to do a, a Litiana version. So the next slide will show you that. Okay, so we need to go back a little bit. 
Go back, go back, go back. Just click back through that slide. Okay, so let me go to this. Here we go. Let me just, let me just talk it through, yeah? So I want you to finish this song for me. Here we go. Uh, let me go through this slide. Here we go. So this is the first song, okay? I want you to see if you can. Jesus loves me this. The realization the other day that my life, for whatever it's worth, my life has been about this, that it is to testify about God's goodness and grace. In 2002, I sat down and I wrote these dreams and plans that I had. And I remember writing it down. And you know what? I still have that sheet of paper right here. But I put it on the screen so you can see it, yeah? It goes around in my Bible like this. You might do some of these five-year plans. It looks a bit haggard and stuff. Some of these dreams, by the grace of God, have been accomplished. Others not. But I want to tell you, if you were to look at this one here, on this side, number two. Can you see the title, Travel There? I am living the dream, people. This is the dream. To travel and talk to young people about God's grace. How much better can it get than South Africa? Turn to the person next and say, God's going to do this for you. Because it's about loving, baby. That's what it's about. Our love to God and God's love to us. That's what it is about. Next slide. And so... Let's go through these ones quickly. I came back 2007, and these are the places God took me to. I got to Western Australia. Let's go through quick. Fiji in February. Then the next month, March, I was in Victoria. And then the next month after that, I was in Fiji again. And then the next month after that, I was in the Solomon Islands. And the next month after that, I went to South America. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got to see the Iguazu Falls by the grace of God and the goodness of Linda Coe. And then I went to Paraguay. And then where else did I go? I went to Brazil, and then I went to Argentina, and then I went to Melbourne. Melbourne, hello, Sydney. Oh, thank you, thank you, Melbourne, okay. Adelaide, and so forth, and so forth. Let's go through right to the end there. By December, oh, there was Pablo. By the December, I was back in Fiji again. So why do I tell you all of those things? Because at that point in my life, next slide, I realized I am God's beloved. And you know, it's easy to feel that you are God's beloved when things are going well. Yes? It's easy to feel that you are in God's favor when life is good. And you know what? Pastor Black just preached about it here. Isn't, isn't that amazing how good God is? All right. So I'm just following the brother, okay? When life is good, it's easy to praise the Lord. Okay? But when those lines are long and the buses are late and people are shoving and pushing, is life still good? When we, when we get to our residence and there's no food, is life still good? Are we still beloved of God? Are we still beloved of God even when things are not good? Yes, we are. You know why? Because God has placed us on this earth to testify about his goodness and his grace. And that is our calling. That is your calling for you to share your story of what God has done for you. And when you share your story, you are sharing God's love in your life. Young people of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'm here to tell you that right here, right now, our loving God is wanting to teach me. He's wanting to teach you. He wants to teach us to be more like Him. For beloved, let us love one another for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is, because it's about love. That's right. It's about love, baby. We've been here in South Africa for a few days now, yes? And, you know, when you look at the currency of this nation, we see a particular face on almost every note. Whose face do we see? Nelson Mandela, okay? We see Nelson Mandela's face in, these, in, in the currency. And you know, in his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom, 
Nelson Mandela says this, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. And you know, young people, yeah. give glory to God for the life of this man, Nelson Mandela. And what I love most about this is that, you know, Nelson Mandela was a young man. He was a youth when he made these decisions about how he would live his life, okay? I had the privilege of visiting his home the other day. And you know what? When I read the things about this man, I am in awe of what God has done through this man for this country, South Africa. And you know, he did these things as a young man. And then just up the road from there, there is this museum to a young boy, Hector Peterson, in this next slide. Hector Peterson was born in 1963, and he became the iconic image of the 1976 Soweto uprising of apartheid South Africa. And you'll see that in the next picture. This image was, was played all across the world about the struggles that were faced in this country. But it's about the young people who decided that they would love. All right? And this, stay with me here. I want to go to the next slide. And I want you to look at this person, these people, this person here. You know, when we think of Mrs. White, we often see the picture of her when she's a little bit older. But you know, we forget that Mrs. White was a young person when God chose to use her. She was 17 years old when she had her first vision. You remember this story? She holds this big Bible up in her hand for like 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes or so. She was a young person. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you the young person? This is what it's about. Are you the young person that's gonna stand up and be the one that shows Jesus? You know, we're talking about uh, God using people in mighty ways when they're young. You know, our church, our church leaders, I believe Byington was the first president of the General Conference. He was 65 years old. But you know what? He would have become president because when he was younger, he would have served the Lord, yes? Yes or no? Okay. And then there was this guy, James White, who was 44 when he became the president of the GC. Okay. And then Andrew, who was 38 when he became the president. What am I trying to say? God wants to use young people to finish this work. Are you the young person? Are you the young person? So we need to love each other. We need to be loving towards each other. This image, the next one that you see, is the one that we often see about Mrs. White. This is the pictures that we see and we remember them. Oh, they were the old people, yes. But you know what? We must not forget that they were young once. So when you were young, this is your time. Next slide, please. In his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, John Ortberg writes these words. Next slide, thanks. He writes that we are called by God to live our uniquely created selves, our temperament, our gene pool, our history. But to grow spiritually means to live increasingly as Jesus would in our unique place to perceive what Jesus would perceive if he looked through our eyes, to think what he would think, to feel what he would feel, and therefore to do what he would do. So if we lived our lives as Jesus would, that would mean that we would love exactly where we are. It would mean that we would impact our world, our community, our cities, like the faces we saw before of those young people, Despite the hardship, despite the, the 14 hours of travel and the delay, they were in the place that they had always wanted to be. And God calls us to come to this place. He calls us to live our lives in this space and to live it for him. God has called us to love each other. And by this, everyone will know that we are his disciples, that we are his followers. They're not just words. They're not just clanging symbols. Micah 6, 8 says it this way. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, 
to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Beloved young people of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, it's not just about knowing the words to the song. It's not just about knowing the Bible texts. Beloved, your God, my God, our God, calls to us and says, I've shown you how to live. 2,000 years ago, I came and I, I walked around this earth. God says that his son came to teach you that so that you would not forget how to love the living. But you know what? Should we forget? God says to us today, return to me, beloved. The invitation to return to God, our source, the wellspring of love, is so that we may daily witness how to love our living. We will be empowered to do God's will in our cities, in our communities, and in our places of living. Because when we've been in his presence, when we have been with God, the presence of love, we will do as God does. We will then be as God is. And we will love because God loves us. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's about love, baby. Let's go to the next slide. In the SDA Bible commentary, we, we read here, pure love is simple in its operations and separate from every other principle of action. Love is a heavenly attribute. The natural heart cannot originate it. This heavenly plant only flourishes where Christ reigns supreme. Where love exists, hear me people? Where love exists, there is power and truth in the life. Love does good and nothing but good. Those who have love bear fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. That from uh, um, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7. So why we forget we are God's beloved? I'd like to suggest three things. We forget we are God's beloved because we get busy living life. We get busy living life. We forget the dreams that God placed in our hearts for our lives. We forget things that God whispered to us when we were young of the things that we wanted to do. We forget because we get busy living this life. Out of sight, out of mind is about this idea that perhaps we don't take the time to read God's word. We need to spend time daily reading God's word. We need to read his promises, his love letters. I was in Papua New Guinea um, which is one of the countries in my division. Earlier this year, I was with uh, Dr. Nick Cross and his wife, and we were going around doing our World Changes Bible project. And I was feeling a little bit unsettled because there'd been some, um, there'd been a situation happening in Papua New Guinea where there'd been some crime, and as a female, I was feeling a little bit um, unsafe. And I remember going to the Word that particular morning and feeling just like I don't really want to be here, but I'm here right now. And in Luke chapter 10, I read these words. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and this is the part, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And in verse 3, it says, Go your way. Behold, I send you out as a lamb amongst the wolves. You know, I've read this Bible a couple of times. I've read that verse many, many times. But never before had it meant something to me as it did that morning. Never before had that passage of Scripture meant so much to me. And I look down and Nick is smiling at me because he knows the story. An Australian man had just been killed. And the woman that he was traveling with had been, um, had been, had been attacked. And I was feeling, because I was traveling with a strip, and oh, I'm next. <laughs> and I open up the word, and this is what God says to me that day. Go, I'm sending you out like a, a, a sheep amongst the wolves. But, but this is the thing. But what it says there is this. Behold, I, and I'm reading further on, and in verse 19 it says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's the end of that story. As scared as I was, God in his word 
reminded me that he was for me. So we forget we're God's beloved when we get too busy living life, when we don't spend time in the word, it's out of sight, out of mind, and when we stop communicating, when we stop talking to the creator of the universe, when we stop talking to the God who loves us so he can tell us the things that he wants for us. The desire of ages says that I'm the vine and you're the branches. You know this. So that's the next slide, yeah? And let's keep skipping through this. I want to go to the end. We'll go through. And the, the key point that I want to relate to you is the next slide. Well, okay, that's a nice picture, but the one after that. Thanks, my brothers. All right. Thank you, Jephthah. Okay, doing a great job with this terrible woman. So the soul dead trespasses and sins receives life through connection with Christ. Okay, so this is us. By faith in him as a personal savior, the union is formed. The sinner unites his weakness to Christ's strength, his emptiness to Christ's fullness, his frailty to Christ's enduring might. Then he has the mind of Christ. So the thing is, if we are to return to Christ, if we are to return to God, these are the things that happen. The humanity of Christ has touched our humanity, and our humanity has touched divinity. Thus, through the agency of the Holy Spirit, man becomes a partaker of the divine nature. He is accepted in the beloved. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's about loving, baby. That's what it's about. All right? That is what it's about. God calls us to himself. God calls us to himself and reminds us to return to him. So if you're not feeling loving, let's return to God. Nehemiah 1.9 says this, But then if you turn back to me and do what I have commanded you, I will bring you back to the place where I have chosen to be worshipped even though you are scattered to the ends of the earth. Throughout history, God has been constantly calling his people to him, to return to him. So how do we remain God's beloved? We remain God's beloved when we answer that invitation. We return to him. We love the life that we are given. It doesn't matter what part of the world you come from. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter what your position is. It doesn't matter what your education is. Love the life God has given you. Love the place God has placed you. Because that is a testimony to the world that you live in. In the cities that you live in, that is how you will make an impact. Because you will testify about God's greatness and God's goodness in your life. Because that's where he has placed you today. And you know what? More than anything, I encourage you to read the word. Read this love letter that God writes to you, that he writes to me. Read it because this is what God wants for us. Because God is for us. My last passage of scripture for this morning, as I close, is Zephaniah 3.17. Zephaniah 3.17 says this. For the Lord your God is living among you. Read it with me, people. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in with his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. I want to just ask for you to be just quiet for a moment. There's this song I want for you to listen to. And I want for you to hear God's heart for you. Thank you to the guys at the back. There's slides that go with the words of this song, so um, there's a song plays. The words can come up on the screen if you want. There's three slides to it. And I want you to hear this song, and I want to pray that you know that this is God's heart for you, and he's calling to you. It's the song, You're My Beloved, by Carrie Jo.
calls to you. He calls to me. Return to me, beloved, and I can teach you how to love. Let's pray together. Abba Father, we pause in this place. In the stillness of this moment. To testify that we are loved. We know that things have not been easy. And Lord, at this time, we want to think of our leadership team who've worked so hard for us to be here. We want to thank you for Pastor Gilbert Kanji and the team for the work that they have done and for the people here in this division who have supported and cared for us. We come from different walks of life, different expectations. But Lord, in this place, we're reminded again that you love us. And we thank you for your love. And so, Lord God, when we don't feel like being loving, we ask you to, remem- we ask you to remind us to remember that it's about love. When we are stressed, we ask, Lord God, that we will turn to you. But, Lord, for all intents and purposes, as we spend this time here for the next few days, we want to pray for just joy and peace. And just an understanding, Lord God, that you've called us to be your agents of change in this world. Help us, Lord God, to impact not just South Africa, but the cities from which we came. Because we do it with you loving us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.